Um, lovely to see you all. Um, my name is Daniel Venard. I work at an organisation called the World Resources Institute. Um, if you've not heard of it before, we're a, a non-for-profit uh, sustainability research agency. Um, but we use that research to try and drive action on critical social and environmental issues. Uh, we've got an office in London of about 40 people, but our head office is in Washington DC and we have uh, different offices around the world that work on critical social and environmental issues, of which clearly food and what we're talking about today is one. Now, as Tim, I think, uh, very eloquently and inspiringly put, you know, we've got a big challenge here that we need to work on. But the question is, I suppose, is, well, how do we do it? How do we get people to shift towards sustainable diets, to change the proportion of food that they eat? Less meat, especially beef and lamb, but more plants. How do we do it? Well, what I find inspiring is that actually there are organisations around the world now, uh, food service operators, that are actually beginning to make this happen. So just some examples that I've heard of recently. A, a chain in, the, uh, in, in Basin, Sweden, but uh, kind of uh, dotted throughout the Nordics, uh, Max Burger, they've been working for the last three years on this agenda. Uh, they're a burger chain, but they've been able to reduce the sales of their beef and lamb, um, being 87% of their sales, down to 60% in three years. Uh, and they've also increased their sales of vegan and vegetarian products from 2 to 20%. Uh, not far from here, the University of Cambridge, they've actually changed their offer completely across their colleges, and they've been able to reduce their sales of ruminant meat by about 54%, so that's beef and lamb. Um, and in Oakland, California, uh, there's a school district, uh, the school district there, they've been, just within two or three years, been able to reduce the amount of animal products that they serve the children by about 30%, and in turn have reduced the greenhouse gas emissions by 14%. So this change happening, we're beginning to see this as an achievable end. Um, but what I find interesting is not only is it happening, but how organisations are doing it. Because what we're beginning to see at the World Resources Institute is that actually there's many really interesting strategies and interventions and tactics that can be used to help make this happen. No longer is this just about let's educate the consumers, give them some information in the restaurant, and then maybe put one or two vegan and vegetarian dishes on the side in the vegetarian section. Actually, there's so many more things that we could be doing. And so actually, We've been running a programme for the last three years trying to research different ways of how operators can make this change happen. Um, we've reviewed about 5,000 academic papers that touch on this. About 150 of them in particular offer a uh, perspective on how to do this. We've interviewed about 60 different operators um, that are doing work in this area. And what we found is there's actually about 57 different types of strategies that you can use to nudge your consumers towards eating more sustainable diets. Um, th this is all of them here. Uh, what we recently done is we asked, um, again, about 60 or 70 different operators um, to take all those 57 and rank them on how feasible they think that they are in doing and how impactful they are. And uh, you probably can't see here, but this is, uh, this is all of the 57. Uh, and at the bottom is the impact, so from low to high, and on feasibility, low to high. And what we find is that, that, that just on the judgment of industry is that there's about 23 different strategies that we think an operator can use. Now, um, this report, with all of this, you'll have these slides, but this is all coming out in September. So I'll just give you a little flavour, um, but don't worry, I can, I can send it all through to you. Because what we find in this upper quadrant is that actually there's a range of uh, interventions that can be done from people uh, how to um, engage your staff, both, both front of house, front and back of house, in uh, offering and selling these products, changing the products themselves, making, um, making them, uh, improving them, increasing their variety, uh, plant-based meats alternatives, changing the placement, changing the presentation, and changing the promotion. Now, obviously, that's, that's quite a lot. I'm not going to go through all of them, but what I thought I'd do is just pull out one or two of them now just to kind of give you a little flavour of, of what's possible. Uh, the one I'm going to pull out is actually the one, a uh, few of the ones at the very top here, which is about changing the language used to describe plant-based foods. Um, so, basically, um, at WRI, uh, as I said, we've been researching different ways of shifting diets. 
Um, and one of the hunches that we had two or three years ago was that the language used to describe plant-based food is not nearly as delicious and enticing sounding as meat. You know, slow-cooked lamb, brisket, Sunday roast, carrots. You know, I mean, we, we, we're not, we, we had a sense that it, we weren't in the same ballpark. So what we've done is a series of studies, um, uh, online studies, field studies, uh, about 13 with over a million consumers across the US and UK, testing alternative like types of language that can be used to potentially entice consumers to make choices. When we started this work, um, one of the first things we do, as, 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 as we always do at the World Resource Institute, is undertake a literature review um, and see uh, what insights there were already out there from, from, from academic studies. Um, just three of them, I think, uh, jumped out at me and uh, I particularly like. Um, one of them um, was a study done about um, five or six years ago now, where a group of consumers were um, uh, all given glasses of mango lassi. It was all exactly the same mango lassi. But half the group, so say this half, you, your mango lassi was described as healthy, whereas the other gr group, this side for example, uh, the mango lassi was described as unhealthy. And at the end, they asked con the, the participants to rate how tasty they thought it was. And the ones who'd been giving it described in a healthy way said it was about 50% less tasty than the ones who'd been giving it described in an unhealthy way. Um, a similar experiment uh, with cookies. Again, same cookies. Consumers were given all the same, but half described healthy, the other unhealthy. And then at the end, they were asked how filling they were. <coughs> And the ones who'd been given it described as healthy said it was 40% less filling. And when the cookies were left out, uh, they actually then ate way more cookies. Um, but I think a, a, a kind of another fascinating study um, that just shows that language and how food is described not only changes your psychological response to food, but it can change your physiological response to food, was a study done by our partners at Stanford University um, uh, about four years ago where they replicated the mango lassi type of work, uh, but it was with milkshake this time. Uh, this time, say this half of the room, the milkshake was described as a sensi shake with uh, 104 calories, but the other part of the group, uh, it was described as an indulgy shake with 620 calories, but as I say, it was exactly the same uh, milkshake. And what they did was they uh, gave people the milkshake and then they took uh, blood samples and monitored the level of ghrelin in people's system. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone. And they found that consumers who'd been given the milkshake that was described in a healthy way had three times a higher level of ghrelin in their system, so were actually physiologically hungrier. So we know from behavioral science work that actually how food is described can have a really important bearing, as I say, on our psychological and physiological responses to food. But I suppose the question is, well, what, what, what does that mean for uh, plant-based foods? Well, what we've been playing with is uh, how the current set of language um, influences, uh, it plays into that. This was an experiment we did with London School of Economics about two years ago, where we took a menu of eight dishes, two of which are in here are, are vegetarian. We gave it to 1,000 consumers in an online setting and asked them to, to make a choice. Um, and about 13% of them chose those dishes. And then we took the same menu, but we took the two vegetarian dishes and put them in a vegetarian box. And in doing so, uh, the number of people who ordered them was about 56% less. So what we consistently find is when things are named vegan, vegetarian, or meat-free, typically sales are significantly reduced. Um, but on the flip side, what we've been also looking at is, well, how can you use language in a different way to potentially entice people? This was an experiment we did uh, with Sainsbury's in their cafes, where we actually took, they have, um, I don't know if you've been to their cafes recently, they have boards up. And um, what we did was we took their meat-free dishes and we changed the names of those dishes. So, for example, they have a meat-free sausage and mash. And we created alternative names and we monitored for 10 weeks uh, in eight stores versus eight control stores sales. And what we found by shifting the name from meat-free sausage and mash to Cumberland Spice veggie sausage and mash, we found that Cumberland Spices were in the veggie sausages, we increased sales by 76% over that period. So I think what we're finding just on this one intervention is that actually changing language can re be a really effective way 
at shifting sales. And, um, and, and we now, we publish all the work in February. Um, you can either contact me or just look online, type in WRI, um, uh, the language of food. And we now have clear do's and don'ts, um, uh, generic, and we can get into that, uh, if not, about how do you do this. So, so, so clearly one, one intervention. Um, uh, but as I said, if this and other types of interventions are brought to bear, we think it can really shift, um, help shift people towards sustainable diets. But I think, as we've alluded to, um, it's all very well one or two organisations doing this, but we're not going to bring about change if there's just one or two organisations doing this. We need to think about how we get lots of organisations implementing these changes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, very much in the spirit of what Tim was laying out, we um, uh, announced last year a program uh, called the Cool Food Pledge to help make that change happen. Um, and I'm pleased to, to say today that uh, SRA is now a partner of this, um, along with uh, the UN Environment Programme, Healthcare Without Harm, Practice Green Health, and then EAT, for some reason their logo fell off. Um, <laughs> and Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, I don't know where I went. Um, and uh, basically, this is a, a programme, it's a platform to help companies um, who provide food um, through their canteens to their employers, employees, restaurants, universities, hospitals, and public facilities to provide delicious food while slashing food-related greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it basically works um, by doing three things. Um, the first thing it does is um, helps organisations that become part of it, either directly with ourselves or through partners such as SRA, um, to make a pledge to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of the food that they serve um, by 25% by 2030 um, uh, relative to a, a 2015 baseline. Um, I won't go too much just for time into the science of why that target's there, but just to say um, this is uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, as of 2010, and this is where uh, we need them to go to uh, to be compliant with Paris targets for greenhouse gas emissions. That's a 67% fall, so basically a 25% decline uh, is, is, is 2015 to 2030. So first of all, organisations commit to that science-based um, target. But what we then do is we've developed over the last two or three years with 23 universities and about 10 different companies a methodology for how greenhouse gas emissions of the food that you, of, of an, or, an organisation serves can be calculated. So what we do is we gather in uh, food purchase data, not of all food, but just a subset of the most impactful. We take that and then we create a, a calculator that then um, determines the greenhouse gas emissions <coughs> of that food. So this here is for a fictitious company. Um, they <laughs> serve 279 million pounds of food. And you can see here, beef accounts for about 4% of their volume, dairy 28 fruits and vegetables, 12%. But when you overlay the greenhouse gas impact of those different foods, what you get is a very different picture, very much in line with the um, data that Tim showed, that the greenhouse gas emissions of those food is very different. So although beef is 4% volume, actually greenhouse gas emissions accounts for 49% of the restaurant chain's um, food uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So the first thing we do is, is gather that data um, and then help provide this baseline. And then organizations that sign up to this then commit to help go along on, on this journey. Um, just as an aside, um, this program is, is currently focused uh, on greenhouse gas emissions, but with this data set, um, we're able in the future to start to overlay other environmental metrics like water, biodiversity, etc. But for now, the scope is very much on greenhouse gas emissions as we get going. Um, so, so the first thing is pledge. Uh, the second thing is then to help organisations that want to become part of this movement realise that target, we then provide all the knowledge and insights on how to develop a plan in this space. So that um, uh, initial slides that I shared, all about the different interventions and some of the insights on language, uh, we provide that to signatories, either that work with us directly or through the SRA. Um, we are uh, just about to uh, publish a strategy playbook that lays out all of the top 23 strategies and how to do them, a diagnostic tool to help organisations determine what they should do, um, and then directories of different organisations that you can contact to actually 
um, who can provide solutions, and a sharing and reapplying network amongst different companies. And the third thing that Cool Food Pledge does after Pledge Plan is promote. So what we're keen to do is for organisations that are on this journey, that are really committed to this future, is to uh, celebrate them, to get them to be seen as the pioneers that, that you are, um, and to really generate um, a reputation wins for your organisation. Working with big media outlets around the world will be driving awareness of organisations that are part of this, but also with consumers. Um, in September, um, the brand will be coming out. Um, we're calling it Cool Food Delicious Climate Action, and we're working with marketing agencies to create collateral and material that you can use directly with your consumers, um, branded or unbranded, if you want. And I suppose just, just to end, really, um, is that we announced this last year, but it's being launched on September the 24th at UN Climate Week in New York. Um, uh, we've already got um, uh, about 15 signatories that now actually serve about 150 million meals. Uh, we're on track for about 50 by the end of this year, who serve about a billion meals. We're aiming for 10 billion by 2022. And as you can see, we're now beginning to, although, although we haven't even launched yet, we're going to get Hilton's just signed up, Max Berger, Morgan Stanley, lots of um, uh, healthcare sites, uh, but we have a series of big universities, hospitals, and then some really big chains coming on board as well. Um, so we're very proud to have SRA um, as a partner of this. Um, together, I think we want to be able to provide the solutions that can enable you to actually make this change and uh, make Foodprint a uh, success.